Now we've got Congressman Jamie Raskin. Congressman, thanks so much for taking the time. Always great to see you. The pleasure is mine to be with you, Brian. Thanks for inviting me. So we'll get into the politics in a moment. But first, you know, you're going through treatment for cancer right now. Um, how is how is that going? What are what are doctors saying? How much longer? Well, the big picture is excellent news that doctors are giving me a very favorable prognosis for uh, defeating um, the lymphoma, the large grade B cell lymphoma, triple hit. Um, and, um, so that's the headline news, but, um, you know, I'm still slugging it out in the trenches with chemo and it is no fun. I would not wish it on my worst, (laughs) worst enemies in the world. You know, when, um, Tucker Carlson came out with his propaganda reel about January 6th, there was a flood of death threats. I think I got 13 death threats the next day. And I was thinking about, um, you know, how low do you have to go to send a death threat to some guy going through chemotherapy? And um, but uh, I thought, you know, even those people sending me death threats, I would not wish this upon them. I mean, it is just no fun. And my heart goes out to all of my uh, my fellow chemo uh, warriors across the country um, because it is tough and it's you know tough on the body and it's tough on the mind and it can cause neuropathy, which is like freezing tingling numbness in your fingers and your toes and so it's no fun but in the big picture we're living in a time where science has allowed us to defeat the dread disease and and that's an important thing you've you've been so present in these oversight hearings lately is that twice as hard given what you're going through with these treatments or does it actually help in the sense that you have something of a distraction yeah i mean i i've organized my chemo therapy around weekends and recesses. So I'm not missing any hearings or votes or anything. Um, And I would say that uh, working has been um, effective for me. I think if I were at home, I would be focused much more on my symptoms and I would be even, um, you know, drowning in a lot more um, self-pity than I have been. So, well, well, you know, first off, thanks for, you know, taking the time to do this today. And, uh, you know, I know I speak for everybody in saying that, that you know, we hope that you get better and, and wish you the best. So uh, so with that said, let's, you, let, let's jump into the politics here. As of this recording, we're still waiting on a slew of indictments to be handed down for Trump, including at the DOJ for inciting the insurrection on January 6th and in Fulton County, Georgia, for trying to pressure Brad Raffensperger to find non-existent votes. You were the lead impeachment manager for his second impeachment trial regarding the insurrection. You were on the January 6th committee. Uh, What would it mean for you to see an indictment passed down on an issue that you've so obviously poured so much of yourself into? Which one are you talking about? You're talking about Georgia or? I mean, I mean, either one, just anything encompassing, anything encompassing the events leading up to the to the election, including his efforts to overturn it and ultimately the insurrection. You know, I'm a believer in the Constitution, and I feel like the House of Representatives really did its duty twice. Um, And in the second impeachment, uh, we had um, a strong bipartisan coalition. You know, we had um, 10 Republicans who joined us, all the Democrats, in finding that Trump had incited a violent insurrection. And we went over to the Senate. Um, and we ended up with a 57 to 43 vote, which is a pretty resounding majority, but he beat the constitutional spread. We needed 67 in order to hit two thirds. Um, and that was unfortunate, but a lot of the rhetoric of the Republicans was, well, you know, um, he can just be prosecuted later. We don't really need to convict him. And of course, um, McConnell's counterfeit, um, evasion at the end was to say, well, the impeachment managers have made their case. He is factually, ethically, morally responsible for everything that happened. But we don't have jurisdiction to try the case because he's no longer president, which cut against more than two centuries of precedent, um, which said that you can both try and convict someone whether or not they hurriedly resigned from office in order to avoid it. Um, So now we're in a situation where, well, all of these moderate Republicans have the chance to say we're doing the right thing in the prosecutor's office by prosecuting. But of course, all the 
diehards are saying, oh, how can you prosecute a next president? How can you interfere in, a, in the next presidential election and so on? So, you know, they've got an argument for every occasion in order to drape their guy in impunity. Um, and it's frustrating people, and I share people's frustration and, you know, people's sense of injustice and, and indignation is so strong and the wheels of justice turn so slowly and in such an ineffectual way that it makes people really mad. But it is the price of living in a democratic society that has the rule of law. And it, it's infuriating that somebody who is, you know, a one man crime wave and who so consistently thumbs his nose at the rule of law gets the benefit of due process and gets the benefit of the presumption of innocence. But that is the price that we all pay for being in this kind of society. And let's just hope that everybody gets that same benefit of presumption of innocence and due process that Donald Trump has gotten up until this point. Digging in specifically to the January 6th stuff, what was your reaction to Trump's calls to violence against District Attorney Alvin Bragg and his suggestion that the NYPD shouldn't defend anyone on the left? Uh, I mean, it's an outrage. It's a scandal. Um, it's it's a purely fascist form of political rhetoric about justice. I mean, fascists don't accept that there's a rule of law that applies to them. So any time that a right wing extremist is subject to the rule of law, whether it's Donald Trump for um, uh violating campaign finance laws or other laws in order to pay off his mistresses or Donald Trump not paying plumbers and small business contractors and electricians or Donald Trump inciting an, an insurrection or uh, insurrectionists assaulting federal officers, then they immediately turn attention to who the judge is or who the prosecutor is. So they personalize it. So they reject in that case the idea that there's a system of justice that um, applies to them like everybody else. Now, of course, if one of their enemies is caught up in something or even one of their best friends is caught up in something, like take Michael Cohen, who was Trump's lawyer and consigliere for all that time, um, and then took the heat for him, um, and then became an enemy of Donald Trump, well, then he's just a convicted liar. They don't mention the fact that he was convicted of lying for Trump, but they assume the integrity of the justice system because that works against someone who's now their enemy. Yeah. You know, I know this is more of a pundit question, but it's along these same lines. What are your thoughts on this notion that Trump is desperately trying to sell that any indictment would make him stronger? I mean, I suppose it's a, a Nietzschean concept that plays in with the general constellation of fascist concepts that he's put together, you know, anything that doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Um, and it will just, you know, deepen the animosity and hatred of his movement. He might be right about that. I mean, he, you know, he got up and he made that speech to Nick Pack and, um, you know, I think he's been going around saying there will be death and destruction if I'm prosecuted and um, I am your revenge. I am your retribution. Um, again, that that's a purely fascist form of political rhetoric. And look, we know who Donald Trump is. I mean, the question is, who's everybody else in the Republican Party? I mean, are they willing to walk the plank all the way down to the point of more fascist insurrectionary violence against the Department of Justice, against the FBI, against police. How far are they willing to take this? It's a remarkable experiment in human nature. It's almost like, you know, real time Milgram experiment. Yeah. And we're we're watching the Overton window constantly shift and, and, and the goalposts constantly be pushed back. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, to answer your question, it does seem to be okay for them every single time. I mean, there isn't a whole lot of pushback regardless of what he does. I mean, you know, the, these Republicans would rather literally run away than answer questions and, and, you know, respond to a bunch of this stuff. But with that said, I, I do want to, to switch gears here to your oversight hearings. And 
First off, there was a moment in a recent oversight hearing where Lauren Boebert tried to land some type of a gotcha question on D.C. City Council member Charles Allen by accusing him of decriminalizing public urination in D.C. Here's the clip. Mr. Allen, based on these statistics, I, I, I would like to talk to you um, about some, some other things um, that are going on here in Washington, D.C., specifically an initiative that you led. In November of 2022, you led the charge to reform D.C.'s crime laws. Is that correct? I chaired the committee that that proposal came from. You led this charge, yes, sir. And uh, these charges, these changes, are now law here in D.C., correct? Do you mean the revised criminal code? Yes. Uh, no, those are not the law. Those are not the law. Did... With you, the, you the revised, revised you, you criminal code them. was uh, rejected by... Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I'll talk to Mr. Allen. Yes, Mr. Allen, did you or did you not decriminalize public urination in no, Washington, D.C.? Did you lead the charge to do so? No, it, the revised criminal code left that as a criminal charge. Did you lead the charge to decriminalize public urination in Washington, D.C.? No, ma'am. Did you ever vote code, in right? favor of decriminalizing public urination in Washington, D.C. The revised criminal code that was did passed you by the ever council support, kept it as a criminal offense. Did you, did, and you support this? Criminal? I voted for it, yeah. You voted to keep it as a criminal offense. That's correct. The full council did. We have records that show that you were in favor of removing that criminal offense and allowing public urination. No, the... Is that something that you intend to pursue in the future? No. The legislation that you're referring to that came from the Criminal Code Reform Commission changed public urination from a criminal to a civil offense. The council then changed that to maintain it as a criminal offense at the request of the mayor. Thank you. I yield. So what was going through your mind at that moment, like while you were watching this play out? It was a dismal, tawdry hearing generally. Um, and it was inevitable that Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene would, would bring it further into the mud. I mean, of course, they were fresh back from um, their dramatic visit to the D.C. jail where they went to see the so-called political prisoners, the January 6th defendants. Of course, they never name any of them. You never, they never tell you what their names are because then you would be able to look them up and see what, they what they're charged with. Yeah. There are 20 of them that are in there. Out of hundreds, these are people who judges either didn't want to release or they've already been convicted. I think about half of them have been convicted, but 17 of those 20 um, have either been convicted of or charged with violently assaulting federal officers. And these are the people that they're comparing implicitly to Nelson Mandela, you know, and Alexei Navalny and Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Andrei Sakharov. I mean, political prisoners are people who are in for political or ideological thought crimes against the state. They didn't do anything other than write something or say something that offended the autocratic rulers. Unlike the January 6th defendants who participated in an attempt to overthrow the government and, and most of these people were um, smashing federal officers in the face, spraying them with noxious chemicals, hitting them with poles or Confederate battle flags or what have you. I mean, what an obscenity. Oh, and by the way, they're also in the much nicer facility um, and have access to computer tablets and 24 seven medical attention. Anyway, so they come in to this hearing and they're all beating up on Washington DC because they think this is you know, their best political play at this point and they have no agenda. So they're beating up on Washington and someone has told her that DC tried to repeal the law against public urination, which goes back a century or something. And of course she got all the the facts mixed up. It wasn't true. She refused to take no for an answer. Then people started sending messages around about how her husband, I think, had either been prosecuted or convicted of indecent exposure. And I guess his defense was public urination. And then some people were saying that maybe she was trying to defend public urination and not attack it. it you know, you're dealing with um, a Twilight Zone world over there. Moving on to another uh, element of the Twilight Zone here, uh, you know, and one of the hearings has been about the origins of COVID. Now, the Department of Energy uh, has said that it's likely that COVID was leaked from a lab in Wuhan. Still, four other agencies say that it was the result of natural transmission. But regardless of, you know, the fact, the fact is that we don't know 
what the answer is as of this point, but still Republicans have seized on this as if it's some win for them. Notwithstanding the fact that we still don't have that definitive answer, can you explain how Republicans would perceive anything COVID related as a victory? Well, if I can reconstruct the contortions in, in their thinking, they recognize that everybody rightfully blames Donald Trump for America's catastrophically negligent response to COVID-19. I mean, he was a guy who was in complete denial for weeks about it and then, you know, began pointing fingers immediately and then told everybody to take hydroxychloroquine or everybody try bleach or, you know, and so people, so people generally understand that Trump was the source of the failure of the country to have a plan actually to defeat the disease and we've lost more than a million people. So they think, well, if we can show that um, that China was at fault, um, not by some natural transmission from animals to humans, but rather by the leak from a lab or in the more extreme cases, although I don't think there's any evidence for this, but there's some evidence for the idea of a lab leak. But if there were a deliberate bio assault, you know, by China, then that nobody would blame Donald Trump and his administration anymore. Everybody would blame China. The problem with that, as I've been trying to point out, is that we have now identified 36 different episodes, um, either on Twitter or verbally or written, when Donald Trump aggressively defends and praises the performance of his friend, President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government, beginning in January, saying they're doing a great job, they're doing an excellent job, they're on top of it, we're in constant touch, they're being extremely transparent, they're showing us everything. This went on and on and on. Um, and you know, part of that is just his you know, natural fawning adulation for autocrats and dictators. And part of it is he just wanted to say, oh, well, we don't have to do anything. We're relying on China. So then it's a very odd turn of events to have people say, no, uh, this was a leak from China. Let's blame China instead of Trump. That this just deepens Trump's complicity with it, because if China pulled the wool over his eyes and he's telling everybody they're being perfectly transparent and they're working together, that just makes Trump's culpability worse. Another topic you've had, what I'm sure is the privilege of covering in committee is the woke military, the issue issue that our military is woke. Have Republicans been able thus far to actually explain what wokeness is, or is it just still some catch-all term for anything that they don't like? Well, it's obviously that, um, you know, and we go through phases where, you know, it's politically correct, which is like the toxic phrase, or it's woke, or it's... BLM or whatever, but, you know, um, or it's trans, you know, you know, they will all turn their focus on that and then try to. Yeah, just make the that cultural war issue of the day is taboo. Exactly. Well, you know, we had a hearing yesterday about um, the military's difficulty in recruiting people um, uh, to come. And of course, they don't talk about any of the real reasons. Um, and they have no data at all, no study, no data showing that it's because the military has become too woke. But that's the whole premise of their hearing that the military is too woke and there's no analysis of it. And I said, you know, um, you know, here's a theory that actually has some support behind it. The problem um, isn't that potential recruits are afraid that they're going to become uh, woke. The, the problem is that military re- potential recruits are afraid they're going to become broke. And then it's all about how, you know, 20 percent of people in the military are getting food assistance or on food stamps or going to food kitchens and so on. That's clearly got a lot more. Those material circumstances have a lot more to do with it than the fact that there's a sexual harassment training, which is, by the way, way desperately needed as sexual harassment and sexual assault continue to go up in the military. And even one of their witnesses who was brought in to rail against wokeness yesterday was a woman who agreed that there are studies showing 
that a third of young people say they would not go into the military because they're afraid of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Like that's real world stuff. But I've been thinking about this woke thing because, of course, none of them can define what they mean by it. And I'm not even sure progressives can define what they mean by it. Of course, you know, by the time the right wing picks up on one of these phrases as something to attack, nobody on the left even uses them anymore. So you never hear anybody saying I'm woke or, you know, but uh, the one time I heard somebody actually say to me, they said, stay woke. And I started thinking about that. And I looked up the etymology of the word woke and awake, and then the word vigilance. And they have a a common source, a cognate, vigilance and wakeness and awakeness. And I think when people say stay woke, really what they mean is stay vigilant, because there's a lot of danger out there. And there's a lot of people trying to undermine us. And so if somebody asks me, what does woke mean? I'm going to say it means vigilant, stay vigilant. And that's good advice to people. I know that these Republicans are performing for the cameras, but does your work ever happen behind closed doors with this committee? And if so, do they still spew that same nonsense about wokeness? Like, do they actually believe what they're saying? Yes, they, they all believe what they're saying. They're I mean, high on their own supply. Remember that, you know, Lincoln's party has now become um, a cult of authoritarian personality. And, you know, the, the rank and file membership of a cult, they are absolute true believers and they believe it real strongly. I mean, as you get closer and closer to the top, there are people who don't believe it. They're manipulating it. Well, we have we have the, the Tucker Carlson's of the world, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, as we have those text messages that reveal stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they are people who use propaganda in the the sense of using magic against people who believe in it by those who don't believe in it anymore and understand what a fraud it is. And yeah, Tucker Carlson goes behind closed doors. They understand that Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump and, you know, all of them are out to lunch with their claims about election fraud, but then they're perfectly willing to go out on TV in order to sell that to the cult, because that's that's the cult line and they've got to stick with the official propaganda line. I mean, that's a terrifying thing when that's how a whole political movement and a whole political party operate. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've said a uh, hundred times that they don't view their their supporters as anything other than marks. And I think that bears itself out uh, with these text messages. I do want to uh, uh, end with this. I want to ask about uh, this recent shooting in Nashville. You know, obviously, we just witnessed uh, three nine-year-olds get killed uh, in school. And on cue, Republicans are talking about more guns, arming teachers, doors, not enough God. Will this Congress pass legislation on guns or is there just too much pressure on the Republican Party from the gun lobby to actually maintain the status quo? Yeah, I mean, they are owned uh, lock, stock and barrel by the gun industry and by the NRA. The The real uh, GOP doctrine was voiced by Congressman Tim Burchett who's actually one of the saner and more civilized Republicans you'll meet. I mean, he's kind of a beloved figure around here because he's a funny guy. He's a real human being. But when the the reporters got to him and they said, what did he think? He said, this is horrible. This is terrible. And they said, you know, what are you going to do about it? And he said, we're not going to do anything about it. Nothing can be done. He said, criminals are going to be criminals. And so, you know, he speaks the party line there which is when gun violence happens, their um, their go-to motto is, oh, this was evil. This is moral evil. There's evil in the world. Suddenly, they're all like cloistered theologians just pronouncing upon evil in the world, as opposed to elected officials who are sent to Congress in order to get something done, but they just throw up their hands and say, well, oh, yes, the, you know, three more school children were assassinated in school. There's evil in the world. Say la vie. What more can be done? I mean, it's obscene. And future generations will look back on this as a period where an entire political party basically adopted an implicit policy of mass sacrifice, because they're basically saying we're going to sacrifice all of these innocent people who are being mowed down in massacres and just the daily toll of gun violence to our vision 
doctrine of the Second Amendment, which is a completely twisted and distorted view of the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court has said that, you know, we can pass reasonable gun safety legislation consistent with the Second Amendment. You have a right to handgun for self-defense in the home. You have a right to rifle for recreation and for hunting. But you don't have a right to assault weapons. You don't have a right to get any of it without going through a background check. All of that is consistent with the Second Amendment. But my colleagues have adopted the insurrectionist view of the Second Amendment. The reason they say we have a Second Amendment is so the people can attack and defeat and overthrow um, a dictatorial or repressive government. And that is completely refuted by the text of the Constitution. Article 1. Section 8, Clause 15 says Congress can call up the militia, the National Guard, in order to put down insurrections. The Republican Guarantee Clause says we owe everybody a guarantee of a Republican form of government and we will help the states expel any invasion and put down domestic violence. In fact, it's treason to wage violence against the government of the United States. In Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, if you're an elected official who's sworn an oath to the Constitution and you violate it by participating in insurrection, you can never run for office again. So the Constitution completely rejects insurrection. They say that the meaning of the Second Amendment is the people can become a militia and overthrow the government. And there's no Supreme Court precedent for that. There is no basis for that at all. What they're talking about is treason against the government. And if they were right, Instead of being in jail where they have to go visit them, all of these insurrectionists would be out because they would have had a Second Amendment defense, which they do not. And by the way, if if those conservatives don't want to take your word for it, they can just listen to what Antonin Scalia, who is arguably one of the most conservative Supreme Court justices in modern American history, said about the Second Amendment. And that and that was that it's not unlimited and that you don't have, you know, unlimited rights to any weapon you want in any place you want uh, whatsoever. So uh, let, let's let's end with this. You know, I, I know that you hear from people who are begging and pleading and crying for Congress to do something on this issue. What do you say to those people? Well, we're we're in your camp and we are fighting every day on it. I mean, my colleague Jamal Bowman exploded yesterday in the hallway as Republicans were leaving saying children are dying what are you going to do about it what are you know what is your answer um and I saw a couple of Republicans you know confront him and just utter the NRA dogmas um we're going to keep fighting them we've got to win back the house we've got to win back the senate and it's number one we're going to pass a universal violent criminal background check we are going to pass a ban on military style assault weapon the kind we had a few decades ago and we're going to um, empower the atf which has been so undermined um, by the republicans and we're not going to uh, allow all of their lies about the second amendment to make life dangerous for our people We'll leave it there. Uh, again, thank you for for taking the time and uh, and keep kicking ass. We're all pulling for you as much as we can out here. So thanks again. Thank you, Brian. Keep up all your great work, man. 